Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. So, today we have Bennett Hunter, uh, who's a libertarian from Canada, and he runs the Canadian Libertarian Facebook page as well as a Canadian Libertarian YouTube channel. And you could also find him on Twitter under Bennett Hunter or at I Am Already Free. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, his history, how he became a libertarian, um, and, uh, you know, what, what is, uh, his thoughts on, are of the, uh, libertarian party, um, and also the recent, uh, Larkin Rose, uh, debacle, <laughs> I guess when he went to the, uh, what was it? He was a panel at some kind of libertarian, like, like, like it was like, um, like they were like, uh, what were they asking? Just asking them, asking the libertarian presidential candidates, I think questions, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. and, uh, and what he said to them. So, um, uh, so Bennett, thanks a lot for coming on the show. No problem, Daniel. It's great to finally have a, an interview with you. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I've been uh, I've been following you a lot, you know, a lot on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, you know, you're putting out pretty consistent content, and so I always enjoy um, supporting other content creators because I know how difficult it is to to put out stuff consistently, and uh, you know, and and try to build your channel and build your Facebook page, and you know, get followers and likes and stuff like that. So it's it's not easy, you know. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> yeah. you, you gotta you gotta be at, you know keep on it. And uh, sometimes it gets discouraging, but you're like, you're like, it should be growing faster than this. But um, mm. you know, it's just slowly, slowly, it becomes uh, something that's um, you know you're proud of, right? So yeah. Well, just to reiterate and even add to what you're saying, in Canada, it's it's even that much harder now. Us being your northern neighbors, can, as a Canadian, we're we're growing up with lots of American influence, obviously. You know, through you know television and uh, many aspects, obviously. You know, we have families that travel back and forth but the one underlying problem that we have here in canada that, that you americans although of course you can't use that is completely a, a term to cover everyone because there's exceptions to the rule obviously but because predominantly we stayed loyal <laughs> right we canada were the loyalists right mm -hmm. to the monarchy and, and the, it was the americans that chose to be more you know, individual and, and create their own, you know, their own particular um, philosophy. We still kind of, even, uh, you're probably aware today, even in Canada, we still have to, well, I mean, as a Canadian that already is born in Canada, you don't have to, but anyone that comes to Canada, you have to pledge allegiance not just to Canada, but to the Queen too, right? Wow. So, yeah, we, yeah, we've been subjects of many or multiple mystical entities and we seem to have a harder time to let go of that uh, concept for some reason and i guess that's because of our history right yeah it's amazing uh these ancient um traditions that we uh, still cling to uh maybe partly out of a fear of change and it's it's just amazing when you realize how old these institutions are like you know queens are still in in like 2016 <laughs> right. there's still a queen and a king and a prince are you serious like and right. but, you know in one sense that it's it's kind of funny but in another sense like there really is no um definitive difference between a queen or a king and a president or a prime minister no. you know it's like they're both positions of power and one of them maybe has more of a, you know we call it divine right to rule or just a bloodline let's say and the other one has quote uh the will of the people <laughs> behind it you know i'm right, right. i'm uh, the voice of the people whatever i say you know the people must have wanted it because they voted for me so it's mm. like really it, there's not much difference between the two you know it's just an evolution and it's kind of um, I think it's kind of the way that the uh, sociopaths had tried to maintain their power as yeah. as religion has gone by the wayside. People, you know, they're, they're now saying, oh, it's the will of the people. You know, it's a democracy, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? The way I look at it, and I've, I've heard it, it, you know, talked about and espoused by many different uh, theorists and, and philosophers and many different people, even in on, in the political spectrum. But if you think about it, like you're saying, it's all they're all dogmatic beliefs that are completely entrenched on mysticism. All of it is completely based on mysticism because any human being that even five years or older for the most part can understand that one human being cannot delegate a right or authority they don't personally possess onto another human being. That's an easy thing to understand. But 
like you say, because humans throughout all of history, uh, the smartest people in any, you know, uh, tribe or, or gang or collective, yeah, they realize that the, the smartest thing you can do is control people through their minds instead of through brawn. Brawn takes a lot of resources, a lot of, you know, right, it, right. Uh, it takes a lot of courage too, but if you can control their mind, right. that's the the much easier way to do things. And what I've watched throughout my whole life is whether uh, it was by the fact that I was wa- raised in a religious family, mm. what I've watched is everything, all whether it's state governments, local governments, federal governments, religious ideologies, uh, socialism, communism, fascism, every collective belief, they have the same ver- basic fundamentals. It's subjugating the individual for the collective and and placing an authority on some mystical entity that's actually if you follow it through logically it's an impossible scenario but because we're taught from very early ages and that's that's the trick of it all is really how it works because if you could get through your most informative years without having this jammed into your head Mm. most human beings and i've seen this because i've met them i've known them people that have not and they don't to them it's 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 completely alien if you tell them you know there are certain human beings that should have the authority to dictate and and control your life and steal from you and you should feel that they're doing so under some banner of morality mm. those people understand that that's wrong it's inherently immoral but people that have been raised and indoctrinated through a system uh, well, when I was a kid, I had a double whammy. Um, I was raised in both public school education, but I also had a very religious family that I also had to go through Sunday school. You know, I went I went through church dogmatic things. Now, there are obviously just with every, every, every kind of these philosophies, yeah, they try to teach you some things that are positive attributes and positive as- aspects to it. But to me, as an adult, once you get to be an adult, if you understand civil things like the concept of math or objective reasoning or logic, all you have to do is just follow through with whatever narrative that anyone's presented to you. And once you see that red flag where you see there's a complete contradiction in what they're saying, well, that should tell you right away that it's an impossibility. So, you know, whether you're Canadian and you're following the Queen or you're American and you're following the, the founding fathers or the constitution. Well, even in Canada, we have, well, I, apparently our first constitution was written in 1867. Mm-hmm. And then they, it was reiterated in Canada in 1982 through the, the charter of rights. But it's still, it's basically, it's still another a verse, another, <laughs> right? That's saying that, yeah, we'll give you certain freedoms, but we're still, your authority that mm. to, and that to me is the most important thing that anybody anybody can understand i don't care what your background is i don't care where you what your color what your race what your ideology that you've taught with but at least as an adult you better start to recognize the fact that anything that tells you that you have to give some other human being arbitrary authority over everyone else that should tell you right away that's inherently going to be a disaster for anybody living in that particular geographical landmass Oh yeah, and and it and it actually bothers me to no degree when you hear people talk about these things because I get it because we've all probably been at some stage in our life we all were forced and jammed that into our head and we probably I will admit as a young kid I believed that stuff for a while, mm-hmm. but as I've said in prior videos I became a man my balls dropped I re- <laughs> no but, and I no but then I started thinking critically for myself instead of just what was jammed in my head I actually right. started using just like with math. All I needed was the formulation and, you know, volunteerists, libertarians, anarchists, the people that understand the proper philosophy and the principles. If you understand the formulation, it doesn't matter if you're in India, China, Canada, the U.S., no matter what dogmatic master you have presented before you, Mm -hmm. if you understand the formulation of what liberty truly means, well, you can knock them off anytime you want because you can tell that they're all contradictions. They're based in mysticism. And arbitrary authority mm-hmm. instead of objective reason and logic. Uh, another thing I like to bring up is just like, uh, and Molyneux, Stefan Molyneux has brought this up before, is with the Ptolemaic system back in the day. Mm-hmm. And actually, I wasn't really too much in the Ptolemaic system thing, but I always used to use this even before I understand a lot of these things is, yeah, people back, you know, thousands of years ago believed that the earth was the center of the universe. Mm-hmm. And, and, for to, and to speak outside of that narrative 
It was blasphemy. Mm -hmm. You could be hung, you could be <laughs> whipped, you could be you know, killed at any time just for speaking out against that. But as we know now, people like Galileo or others that realized that that wasn't the case and stood up and spoke out against that, he, that, he was one individual with you know, millions of people opposing what he was saying. But we know now in the future, you know, post those times, we know that, of course, he was honest. Of course, that was truth. Of course, that was factual. Everything he was saying about the fact that the earth isn't the center of the universe, we know to be objectively true. Mm -hmm. Just like now, I always picture in 100, 200, I don't know, pick a time, but at some point in time in the future, humans on this planet are going to look back at, back at us living in this day and age and say, wait a minute. So you guys lived in the information age where you had actually had the capacity <laughs> at your fingertips to understand all objective reasoning, logic, scientific methods, all of these things, but yet you still chose to believe in dogmatic beliefs. And you know the only possible way that could happen is by jamming that into people's heads from very early age, ages. So I understand people when they want to get into the politics, but to me, just like with Stefan Molyneux and others, it starts at home and how you raise your family, mm. how you interact with your community. You know, leading by example to me is the most important thing anybody can do. You know, rhetoric is anyone could, you could be a steak oil salesman and if you're good at it, you know, you can propagate that to other people and they might fall for your crap. Right. But to truly be principled, you have to speak truth to reason and use logically consistent morals and ethics and everything after that. People can choose to do what, whatever they choose, but we all have to live under same, the same universal rules. Mm. With statism, with governments, there's no such thing as universal rules. There's rules for some people, and there's a different set of rules for others. When there's that concept, when there's that capacity for others to have rules outside of the norm, mm. don't even tell me, I don't care if you come from the left or the right, politically speaking. Right. To me, that's just a complete recipe for central planning authority where it oppresses the overwhelming majority of the masses right yeah and um you know one thing that really uh, makes me proud is when i see facebook pages like um you know volunteers in pakistan volunteers in uh, brazil volunteers in india all these different countries volunteers popping up slowly and it's just so beautiful to see that like every everywhere people are embracing these concepts and they're understanding the limitations of statism and the arbitrary um, idea of borders and of nationalism, you know, and uh, and they're beginning to realize, you know, this is one of the greatest cons <laughs> that has ever been perpetrated. The idea that, like you said, um, some people, there's this special group of people that call themselves government uh, that have an exception to morality mm. um, that we are all subject to, right? In, in every single way, you know, in terms of finances, like, like uh, you know, we all have to live within our means, except the government. You know, we, we, <laughs> yeah, we all right? can't, we all can't, you know, rob except the government. We all can't, um, you know, have a big uh, rape uh, institutions except the government. <laughs> mm -hmm. We all can't yeah. murder and call it, you know, a war except the government <laughs> so yeah we all can't counterfeit except the government so you can just go on and on with all the euphemisms that uh, that exist that that parallel um you know you know the state and what it can do and what the individual cannot do so yeah it's really amazing but but um so so can you please get into your your history how you became a libertarian you know what got you thinking about this um and how you came to these conclusions yeah sure uh well that's the thing growing up um First of all, uh, both of my families, from my mother's side and my father's side, uh, my mother's side, I have to admit, there was a lot of status, a lot of dogmatists in that family, whether it was through the, the religion or through, you know, coming through academia. So, you know, completely indoctrinated in the religion of statism. Um, now, on my father's side, but actually on my mother's side, out of there was five girls and one boy. So there's five sisters and one, one brother. Out of all those children, my mother was probably the one out of them all that was the least status. She, was, she actually dropped out of high school, had me, when, I, when she was uh, 16 years old. Mm. Um, and she was a little bit rebellious in that aspect. She wasn't the youngest, but she was one of the younger daughters. 
The rest of them did go on to, you know, doctors and teachers and and I'm not saying that they're inherently moral, but because they were raised in, in, in an atmosphere and they didn't rebel against the dogma that they were taught, it was an easy transition from, you know, the mysticism of their religion to the mysticism of central planning and government. Mm. My mother questioned it a little bit more than the rest, so she was, I guess, quasi status She wasn't fully entrenched into that particular ideology. Now, my father, on my father's side, he comes from a pretty long line of my grandfather as well that were staunchly independent, self-reliant. Uh, I have uh, my, my background on my mother's side is Scottish. My father's side is Irish. Um, I know all about and heard all about how uh, the Irish in particular and Scottish both were oppressed by the monarchies of old world Europe and in, mm. in, in Britain. So it was it was already understood that central authority in in, in my father's family and my father in, in their mindset, they already understood the inherent immorality in central authorities. Now that was from the old world Europe, democracy and you know the new way of doing things was completely new to them. So they didn't really talk too much about democracy per se, because I suppose that was something they were just starting to learn, right? other than that they were taught by their parents but my father was he didn't he was not very he was not really religious uh he was completely no matter how down out and he, they were poor i come from like my mother because they chose she chose to my grandparents and on my mother's side they had money but because she chose not to go along with it she had to step out on her own and and into poverty and same with my father, but because they were self, both together became so self-sufficient and self-reliant without relying on the state or religion or the church, I suppose that helped them to embrace their own understanding of what it means to have individual freedoms and individual li liberty, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, whether you're talking about the state or a family, a central authority figure, that basically starts at home too. Now, when you're, ch when you're a young child, you can't fight that because you know your your parent they're much bigger than you right they have they have a natural authority over you it's not like you can leave your home at four or five six years old and just say but as an adult if you've if you've had any semblance of an objective mind left and you and you realize and you put all this together they realize that between the two of them and they work to help each other to understand this is no, you, you cannot allow any central authority to manipulate, dictate, or control your lives or legislate through governments morality on a people. That, that's not how humans are supposed to cohabitate and coexist with each other. That has to happen naturally and freely. And, and I watched that happen in my father's life and my mother's life and how they did it. Neither one of them has ever had anything to do with the state. They both were fairly successful until my, my dad, he, he met his demise when I was 17 years old. He was actually handicapped uh, from an accident that he had had, had early, but he was so hmm. strong and relying on himself that even when he, he couldn't get work locally because they realized he couldn't handle it, he traveled out west to try to get work because he just wanted to be a... He, he, he was not the kind of guy. He could not go and become someone that would live off of the state, even though he probably would have recognized that, yeah, they stole from him anyways, but he still chose to be a staunchly independent human being. So he chose to go out west, and and I won't get too heavily into it. He was, he was beat to death by people out there. It was a devastating experience for me at 17 years old, but he showed me that if you stand for what is right, and are strong and firm in your convictions, and you know that you're moral, then nothing can ch change that, and nothing should hinder that. And you know what? I take that on to this day, and I'll take it till the day I take my last breath, that nothing nobody can do, just I don't care what anyone says, I will stand firm and strong against, and I don't care how many collectivists try to, you know, that's the other thing I try to tell people all the time. Do you know how easy it is? This is the thing I want all collectivists out there to know or populists. I want you all to know it's the easiest thing on the planet. Easiest thing on the planet because I actually, you know, growing up, I realized if you want to get in with the cool crowd or the bad people, it's easy to conform. Conformity is the simplest thing ever because you're accepted instantaneously mm -hmm. if you conform. Mm -hmm. The strong people among you, the ones with real resolve, 
the ones that are truly independent, the ones that you really should trust are the ones that will not just go along to get along. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Some of those people might piss you off <laughs> because truth sometimes when it hits you from broadside, when you've been told one thing, you know, just like, and I, I like using this as an example, uh, even when I was a kid, it's like we were taught as a kid to believe in Santa Claus. And we all believed that. I believed it wholly. Of course, there was such thing as a Santa Claus. Well, no, I shouldn't say it's all. Some people didn't. But in my particular, because I come from a Christian background, I was taught that, you know, Santa Claus was real. <laughs> yeah. As an adult, it was, or once I get to the point, not an no, I was still a young child. But once I get to the point where someone told me they weren't real, that or that Santa Claus wasn't real, yeah, it was hard at first. You know, it's like, damn, you serious? But you know what? I'm very glad today that someone told me the truth <laughs> right. and that I still don't believe in this mystical concept. And that translate in whether it's religion or statism. To me, that's the foundationally most important thing we're doing, which is why when we have to delve into the politics, it kind of bugs me because I want to stay above that fray. The people who want to delve into the political crap, let them do it. But for people like you or I, let's stay above that fray and just talk to them with common sense, logic, and reason. You know, there's people about there out there that are doing that. To me, the political people that are call them libertarians or whatever they want to call them, if you're you're just all you're doing is stagnating human progress because the human progress, well, for me to to grow as an adult, I had to understand that all these foolish mystical concepts I was taught as a child, for me to grow as an adult, I had to throw them in the garbage behind me and leave that stuff behind. Nobody was saying, well, there might be a Santa Claus, but there might not be. You know, if you left me in limbo for all of eternity, well, of course my mind's still going to be completely confused and confounded mm -hmm. because you're leaving it in limbo. Humans need to understand objective reasoning. That's how we function. I don't care if you're, you know, a hunter-gatherer back in the day. You have to know that two plus two equals four. Don't try to tell me two plus two equals four and a half or four and a quarter or four and three quarter. You have to tell the truth. And that, to me, is the most foundationally important thing. But back to, yeah, with my, my childhood, that was, I think, foundationally, the most important thing I took from both of my parents was to be staunchly independent, to not, and to live and let live. That's another thing too. My parents, they were, I actually kind of consider myself, I think a lot of us and my wife are the same way. I think we consider ourselves a bit of a latchkey kids because I was raised, even though there were certain things that were taught in my family, because they were the probably the first generations that were going, especially with my mother and stuff, were going into the workforce, doing all these things. They put their uh, money, finances, and, and going into work and, and bettering themselves as a priority. So, the, so us kids were kind of left to our own devices. But in a way, that's a, in a way, that's kind of a good thing. Now, I'm not saying there's, there's got to be a fine line, common sense, obviously. But because I wasn't constantly hammered or, or indoctrinated into a certain thing, I had the capacity, the ability to think for myself. They allowed me to think for myself and that helped me to be able to step outside of that dogma as I, as I became an adult. And I could use objective reasoning and logic and say, you know what? A lot of this stuff I was taught as a kid is complete bullshit. And I feel terrible at the fact that I felt it for this stuff as a kid, but I understand that's another thing too. I understand some of the reasons behind it. Sometimes they had good intentions, right? Uh, my grandmother, by telling me a lot of the things that she taught me, I know she had good intentions for me, but when you t teach a child, when you formulate their brain to be subjective to dogmatic beliefs, even though you may have good intentions, every other human being out there don't. And if you, if you allow your children to be raised in an atmosphere where they'll fall for these kind of narratives that aren't entrenched in logic or reason, while well, you're just setting them up for, you know, being good little conformists or slaves for any ruling class. Mm -hmm. That's that's basically how I look at things. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I really liked that you said was, um, um, you know, how it's it's not easy to do what we do because oh. because the inclination, the initial instinct for most people is to conform, right? That you know, to yeah. be socially accepted, and and uh, you know, I wrote in a uh, in a post uh, one time on Facebook. Um, that my desire is not to lead a um, a popular 
life, it's rather to lead a moral life and a virtu- yeah. vir- virtuous life, right? It's not about being popular because, you know, that's actually a logical fallacy. It appeals to popularity. You know, if something is popular, it doesn't make it right, right? Like, you know, murder is murder. It doesn't matter if, if you know, 100% of people are murdered. It's still murder story. Even if there's just one person who disagrees, it's still, you know, it's like it's like if, if 100, 100 people in a room say, you know, 2 plus 2 is 5, does that change math? <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. math, yeah. math like, like the laws of physics, like the laws of, of uh, thermodynamics are like the laws of morality universal yeah. right they, they do yep. not change with numbers it's not an it's not a numbers game right it's 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 about universality right it's about it's about applying the principles to everybody without exception there is no exception to morality whatsoever. exactly and you know what that was actually that point right there was the thing that was probably one of the most important things i understood whether it's through religion or the state is how in the heck is it that, yeah, the very people, whether you're relig- 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 reading from the Bible, and that was actually kind of the other aspect that it's easy to correlate if you come from a religious background. For people that are atheists, which my wife was raised in an atheist family, so I, I know the contrast between the two. But for me, when you see how religion even, like the Bible, uh, my grandparents from both sides and other relatives, I had Protestants, Presbyterians, Baptists, Catholics, so they all read from the same Bible, <laughs> yeah. but they reiterated and made certain sentence structures in that to suit their own preferences, to to suit right. their own ideologies, and that to me is no different than you can translate that completely with statism and political parties. It's to me, there's not one bit of difference between religious dogma or status dogma they're both the same thing you're just you're just using different factions or different tribes right Mm. that's really what it comes down to is just different tribes and what they're saying is join our tribe if you join their tribe we're going to kick your butt or we're going to oppress you or you know to me the foundationally most important thing every human would should understand is nobody nobody on this planet has any arbitrary authority to control and dictate or plunder any other authority. The only reason why that even exists is because people have throughout all of history, whether it's through, you know, pharaohs, kings, uh, whatever, whatever dictators or religious deities, you know, stone gods, whatever people have been taught from early ages to believe that they should conform and subject themselves to some arbitrary authority. That to me Humanity, we're going to see liberty when we finally get humanity on the point to the point where nobody believes in this foolishness, Mm -hmm. where people recognize that we're all just human beings on a big giant rock floating in space at tens of thousands of miles an hour. And what we really need is a proper universal philosophy, just like going from the Ptolemaic system to how we understand scientific values and equations now is we just have to have universal laws, universal rules, universal ethics, universal principles that everybody has to abide by, that there's no such thing. When when humanity gets to that point, then, I mean, I can't even imagine how things will be at that point. It'll be, to me, it'll be amazing. It'll, I mean, think of how much we've accomplished with all of the baggage. Yeah. I mean, we're walking around, most humans are walking around, you could be a hundred pound Weakling, but you're walking around with a 200 pound sack on your back all the time. Drop that shit off and think of how much faster, how much quicker, how much agile, mm-hmm. the agility that you'll gain as a result. And to me, that's what is happening with humanity is, and which is why I'm a big, I don't like political libertarians. I can't stand political libertarians because what they're trying to say is, well, no, we can limit our deity. In reality, there's no such thing as a deity, but but we're going to limit ours. Like the, the contradictions is what kills me, which is why I can't, when I first started understanding what libertarian was all about, it didn't take me a whole lot. And you've heard the saying, I'm sure we've all heard it about six months is where you right. realize, well, no, it, I mean, if you have an analytical or a critical mind, it, it shouldn't take you a whole lot of time before you realize that, wait a minute, you can't go three quarters of the way to liberty. You either believe in liberty or you don't. The ones that are going three quarters of the way, what they're saying is, I want everyone else to listen to what I'm saying, but I want to save that quarter from myself. <laughs> you know, 
I want to keep that just in case. I want to do a little plundering, right? Mm -hmm. No, but like, I don't understand why anyone, if you truly believe in liberty, which is why I don't really trust political libertarians, if you truly believe in liberty, you can espouse, well, my whole thing, and you've probably seen, I don't know if you've watched my videos, is my whole thing is there's reality and there's rhetoric. If they don't match each other, it's, it's complete bullshit. And politicians, they use rhetoric but it never matches with the reality because mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a legitimate form of government. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as me being able, I'm just a normal human being. And as I've said many times, I don't have no authority or right to give some other human being. Like if I want, you know, I'm having, you know, I need a tooth pull. I don't have any legitimate authority to ask my neighbor or two of my neighbors or two and of my neighbors to go plunder everyone else to pay for my tooth to be fixed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that is basically what government is, is a majority democracy. But see, that's the trick of it all. The third way too. That's to me, I, now that I understand things from the macro aspect, because that was the thing too, when you're starting to learn these things, you're always going to, what it, I look at it as it's a big giant puzzle and you're putting pieces together. I haven't got all the pieces together, but I've got enough together now that I kind of can see what the picture is behind. And it all comes down to people using mob rule, mental, like, I don't care if, it, if it's in a republic or a, or a constitu constitutional democracy or parliamentary democracy, such as what we got here. All these, it basically is saying that you should give, whether it's a minority or a majority, because even in Canada, they call it a majority, but really you might as well say plurality because we have multiple parties here in Canada. In the UK, it's even worse, where you could have three, five, ten different parties. So in Canada, you don't even need, in the US, you guys predominantly have, for the most part, two parties. So 51, 49, blah, blah, blah. But I know with the the way the system works, I know it's a little bit more than that. I'm not going to get into how you have the delegates and how the super delegates, but you, basically it still comes down to majority rule. But it's that belief that there's, whether it's majority through numbers or majority through a plurality of numbers, there's no way it, it, that you can give a certain specific segment of your country or your society or your particular geograph ge geographical land. There's no way that any one human being could give another human being that legitimate authority to steal and plunder from others or dictate their lives. Natural laws have always come as a result. I actually remember watching a video. I forget where it was now, but basically the most natural laws come just as a direct result with humans interacting and cohabitating with each other because we recognize that, you know, if I go and plunder from my neighbor, well, there's going to be a retaliatory effect or there's going to be some neg negative consequence. Mm -hmm. With the state, with democracy, because you have a constant turnover of politicians, there's no one. one see, people have even said, and I kind of understand where they come out, at it from that and say, well, actually, it's better to have a dictator or a king than a democracy. And, and then on, on the surface, I kind of get that because it's probably fairly easy to lob off the dictator at the top, the one you know person that pretend to be the deity. That's probably pretty easy for people to stop believing that authority. Mm -hmm. But if you could trick people's minds to think that everybody has that authority, all they have to do is wear the badge of the government, right? right. If everybody, if you can trick people into believing, well, all they have to do is go into, you know, whether it's putting on your, you know, your Catholic, uh, your, your, your uh, hat or whatever, or your badge. If you can trick people into telling them that anybody that goes into representing government, that's the thing with democracy is everybody thinks that they can be both the subject and the master. That's what tricks the mind. That's what tricks the mind. So nobody actually understands the concept of actually, no. There's certain people that believe they have the arbitrary authority over others, but people believe, well, but I could be that person too. But in reality, well, if you chose to be that person, that means you're an immoral person to begin with. And why would anyone want you to have any authority over their lives? Right. But because it's a religious, religious dogma, just like every other religion that we're taught from very early ages, people just, they, they fall for it. And it's terrible because it happens through the education system. Right, right, and and um, you, I thought of a couple of things. You said um, you, when you said uh, there's reality and there's rhetoric, and I thought of a Thomas Sowell quote, um, which is um, the first law of economics is uh, that there is scarcity, right? And um, the first 
uh, rule of uh, of politics is to disregard the first law of economics. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in that they don't recognize that there is um, economic law or that there is scarcity, right? That's how they, they mm. act without... Uh, the natural market restrictions, right? That is that is inherent in you know every business and every individual that uh, is not it does, doesn't have the moral exemption, you know, uh, to act, you know, in in a moral way. So, uh, and then the other thing, um, uh, what did you say? Um, the universal law. Yeah, you said when everybody. When everybody, um, you know, you said uh, recognizes the universal laws of morality, you know, it would be such a different place. So let me just say, um, let me tell you, be a devil's advocate for a minute, uh, because sure. when I say something like that to people, um, one of the most common responses I get from other people is, uh, well, in your little anarchy world, you think everyone's going to be an angel and be nice to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're going to have a hard time with that. So what would you say to somebody who, who would say something like that? <laughs> See, now that's foolish. Of course I don't. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the part. And I've actually had that myself. It's, right. No, I, I never in my life do because I actually grew up in the real world. So I right. recognize that. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, the trick of it is, though, that everybody has, has to understand that there's no arbitrary authority that's going to back you up. So right. that means right. my and I actually made a video before, which which actually kind of incorporated the Second Amendment and democracy both to show people. So if you if you believe in government, well, then you believe in everybody should have equal rights. That's suppose what, what they talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, then if you're talking about, I like to use the correlation of if you had people living in all in a room, so take that room as just being a representative of a state or, or, a, or a country, well, either everybody has access to that gun, which puts everyone on an even keel, mm. or nobody has that gun. Now, if nobody has any of that gun, then you have to have universal rules. And same with if everybody has that gun, everybody has, everybody has to follow the same rules no matter which way you look at it. But mm. what, what these people are trying to suggest is that, oh, if there wasn't a democracy or, or a government that people, well, I don't expect people are going to be bad. I will always be ready to, de or, or that will, everybody will be good. I will always take it upon myself to defend myself from anyone that's going to impose their edicts or their, you know, immorality upon me. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I have to somehow give some central authority that power. I have to take that responsibility upon myself. That's what all of humanity, I mean, even back in the day when there were such things as kings and pharaohs, they didn't have the kind of reach, the power that a lot of modern democracy head so there were actually probably more people that lived under more anarchist type situations in the old world because even though the state you know they might have had a lot of central authority back then through because saying the kings were derived their power from the gods but they didn't have the resources the technologies mm -hmm. that modern states do so i i imagine even and i like i say i've heard a lot of my history of the irish and so even though the british empire did have a lot of power over the skies and irish they didn't have the resources mm -hmm. to keep all of scotland or not did neither did all of scotland believe that you know the kings of england had authority over them. that's to me, that's that's to the biggest trick is not that I think people are going to be inherently good or evil, although as you've heard before, like no matter which side of the coin you go, that one. If there's two ways you go, but people that say that most humans are inherently immoral, well, if you suggest that, then why would you want to create an entity of central authority where those people can gravitate to that? Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if they're immoral people on the planet. And you give them this position where it's like, oh, you mean if I go become a member of the government, I can use my immorality <laughs> right. and impose that on human beings? Well, so if you believe the majority of people are the immoral, then you should never have such thing as a state. Or even if you say that a minority of people are, well, if it's only a minority of people that are the bad seeds in society, the majority of the people... you can always overpower them anyway. So why, to me, there's no, no matter which way you go about that argument, mm -hmm. it can be knocked down easily because it makes no sense on either way. The only way it makes sense is if you're a sociopath or a control freak that wants to control other people, then of course the state makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. But everything that we've had, whether it's roads, and that's another thing, actually, I want to bring this up because people mm -hmm. love to bring up the roads. Although lately I've seen that it's not so talked about as much, but 
I actually worked on a paving group in New Brunswick when I was living in New Brunswick for three years. The only time I ever seen one human being that had anything to do with government was the idiot that came out to inspect after how many times he would come to my, my uh, foreman and say, is this how this stuff should be? <laughs> no, but sir, I, I kid you not, man. I, I'll, I'd swear in front of a judge. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is absolute truth. Right. So, yeah, the fact that any, any of these idiots that are foolish enough to believe that government creates anything that we have today <laughs> or, or that you need government for health care. No, you need doctors for health care. You know, you need road crews. You need pavers for, for paving. You want buildings. You want to help the poor. You want to build houses. You need carpenters. You need plumbers. You need electricians. No, you don't need the central authority. No, you don't seem need some mystical deity, you know, and, and, oh, well, we need them to regulate because if we don't regulate these people, well, really these company owners, these people that work for these companies, they actually want to keep their job, believe it or not, because they have families or they want to keep food in their bellies too. Right. So their incentive is to do a good job right. because it's a benefit to them. Right. right? And, and you know this anyways, right. it's a win-win in the free market world. Right. It's a win-win for both sides of the equation mm -hmm. in the status environment, in the status paradigm, it's no, I should win and you should lose. You know, mm -hmm. and to me, that's complete bullshit. Now, in a natural state, there are such things in a competitive environment where there's winners and losers. But that's based on your competitive nature, your, your intellect and what you can provide. Now, if you win out naturally, like in a competitive environment where you may super exceed them as far as monetary value or acceptance in a community, if it happens naturally, that's good. But just because you can impose your authority on a human being that, that that doesn't give you any legitimate you know populism all that happens is because you could just like with insurance people would automatically i know right now i drive a car and if i want to go out drive my car and i know that there are idiots that know how to drive i will have insurance on my car because i want to make sure that i protect myself for the people mm -hmm. that or even people that don't have any ill intents maybe just some accident happens right yeah but do I need a central authority to tell me that? Or do I need a central authority to dictate? Well, that's the other thing. Insurance companies, that's the other thing with these lefties that don't understand. If 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 you believe that, you know, prices should be cheaper and these corporations are ripping you off, well, what, yeah, how do you think it works when a government, when a central authority says, you have to have this insurance and you have to buy it through these companies? Well, of course the company's like, oh, you have to come to me? Yeah. You know what? Should, should, should I, I was going to charge you 100 bucks a month but now that i know you have to come to me now it's 200 right? Should I charge less or more <laughs> right i mean it's that's right. the thing and that's the thing that bothers me the most is if most people would even just take the time just take the time to not only define the terms of the words or the or, or the ideas or the concepts you're you're talking about but to run that through just a small little you know analytical process in your mind just just run that through and tell me how that would work out logically mm. Not what you've been told, but how it would work logically. And I think most people would jack actually genuinely. And I, because I challenge people not just on the internet, like because I work and I'm out in the public every day. So I, I, mm. I challenge people all the time. And I think most people actually understand this stuff. It's just that they're like most people. Yeah, they've been indoctrinated into this religion of statism, and it's a it's a hard thing to break out of mm. if you, especially because there's so many small benefits and comforts that some people mm -hmm. gain from them because being independent and you and you probably know this yourself being independent and strong and self-reliant it's it's not as it's 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 a little more scary it's like the guy that's walking across the tight rope without the the big safety net right <laughs> you got to have a whole lot more courage and convictions to do that right. right so i get but but that's the thing we have to lead by example and tell people and show people how to be strong and courageous Definitely. The state teaches them how to be weak and conformist. You need to be strong and courageous. And to me, that's if you have the proper philosophy and, and you tell people, you know, the proper formulations, equations, you don't have to impose anything on anybody. You just tell them two plus two is four. Yeah. Keep that equation in the back of your mind for all of et eternity and it will reap great dividends you for to you for forever and ever and not just for you but for your successive generations and for all of humanity i mean we have even as humans we do take a couple steps forward but we fall back because you know we're imperfect beings right mm -hmm. but if you think about it over the course of human history i think we're still 
a little bit further ahead today, obviously, than we used to be back, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago. I can't say that objectively because I, I don't know what it was like that. But I do know that the human intellect has expanded. And I can't believe that the human has, intellect hasn't expanded, not just in monetary or economic or, or technological, but in understanding freedoms. I think that's why we are who we are today is we've gotten to the point where we've built off of people from thousands of years have, that started to understand these principles and these values, right, mm -hmm. and these philosophies. And all we're doing is trying to take humanity – uh, prior, you know, you know, for the last couple thousand years, they brought humanity out of the dark ages and they brought them into basically the enlightenment era. And now we're almost like, at, like we're at the teenage years. Right. Right. Mm. I want to bring humanity into adulthood. <laughs> you, we want to bring humanity into adulthood where we're no longer believing that we're supposed to be just mere subjects to a ruling class mm. where we recognize and acknowledge that we're individuals okay. and we have the capacity even even the the lowliest among us that maybe aren't the smartest people on the planet or the most uh, efficient or the strongest we all have our own abilities and capacities to be at least reliant enough to take care of self and if we don't those who don't there's such a small number that the majority of humanity and the wealth that we can create and produce naturally, it's just a sliver in anybody. I know myself, I know you, any human being that I've ever talked to would have the compassion and the morality to help the, the person that can't help themselves. That's an easy, that's probably the easiest thing ever, especially in the modern world we live in where we have such excess capacity. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing nowadays in the modern world where you can say that, but I know what you're saying, rarity, like obviously there is a finite amount of resources on the right, planet. Right. In this particular stage of the game, there, with seven, people, seven billion people on the planet, there is enough resources here that nobody should have to go without or be oppressed or plundered from or dictated to by some central authority. We can do all this stuff in the modern age, in the era we live today, naturally without any central authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know, you you mentioned when you were talking about the roads. Um, it, it's funny when people say that, like, you know, who's going to build the roads? Who's going to educate? Who's going to, um, you know, it, you know, they 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 look at all these things like, you know, we would have never gone to the moon if it wasn't for NASA. We would have never, you know, look at all these wonderful, uh, you know, government research um, laboratories. You know, so so all these things that they attribute that they think are positive, that they think is is. It's government, but really, you know, when you distill the idea of what government is, it's really force. It's just a monopoly on violence. It's just the ability yeah. to use force and coercion to obtain funds, right, through taxation or theft, right? So government itself is not a creative entity at all. It's not, it's not imagination. It's not creativity. Um, it doesn't create things, right? All it does is take money from the productive people, and give it to the non-productive people. <laughs> That's all exactly. it does. And and uh, and by doing so, it perverts the natural free market incentives, right? To towards yeah. being productive. And that's the really sad part is is um you know, like you said, and, and every time every time the government does that, every time, you know, the, every time they tax people, they are they are basically destroying wealth every single time. And like you said, um, if you know, without this parasite on the backs of all of the industrious, you know, how much wealthier could we be today? It, it, it really is tragic to think about that, but mm -hmm. it's true. You know, it's like all of this progress that we have made, um, you know, that we see, that we enjoy, you know, basic stuff like you know, refrigeration, air conditioning, cars, shoes, <laughs> um, and not not to mention electronics, laptops, computers, iPads, all that stuff. Um, you know, that's in spite of. In spite of the state, you know, people wanting to be productive, wanting to create, mm. wanting to serve their fellow man um, in an effort to maybe to to gain wealth and become, you know, wealthier. But, it, you know, in, in order to do that in the marketplace, you have to offer a product or service that they're going to want to voluntarily buy. That's the only way, you know, you know, you, you know, mm. people say, well, you know, there's always going to be scammers. Sure. There's always going to be scammers out there, but you know, rest assured that they're going to be discovered very quickly when you have, you know, all kinds of, um, natural market rating agencies like, you know, you know, Etsy and, and, uh, and on Amazon and, 
and um, what do you call that? Consumer Reports and Yelp and all these different kinds of things. There's always um, there's always market alternatives to what we think of are necessary like like you know people like well without the fda and without the the usda you know people would be buying uh you know poison food all the time <laughs> dropping dead <laughs> and it's just amazing how all of these justifications and like you said um i think the primary reason is because we're all you know 12 years of our lives most of us who've gone to government school yeah just just over and over and over again just shown how important the state is and how wonderful it is and how uh, how indispensable it is and how how much poorer our lives would be if it wasn't there and how you know they broke up the monopolies and how you know they uh, they they destroyed these robber evil robber barons and you know the you know the pledge of allegiance and you know wonderful founding fathers and all this kind of stuff um and it's so difficult to divorce yourself of that idea um and but it but that's our task you know as as um abolitionist modern day abolitionist is to help people to think clearly right like 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 mm-hmm. you i'm often um outside with my kids i have a 5 year old and a 3 year old and we're always out you know meeting other homeschooling families and so i'm out in the public a lot and i talk to people and i like to get into these conversations but you know i don't necessarily say i'm an anarchist or, or voluntarist i just talk to them and and somehow mm. i'm able to get these concepts in, you know, in the conversation, just to get people thinking like, you know, mm-hmm. if, if, uh, if I can't kill my neighbor and call it the war on terror, how can, the, <laughs> how can the soldiers do that? You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. If, I, if I, if I can't, you know, have a, have a, a printer in my basement and, and print, you know, notes and call it money and force people to use it. How can the federal reserve do that? Yeah. <laughs> and force it. So well, yes, so like you, I'm uh, I'm always trying to talk about this stuff, and you know, people I meet. Oh, me, I do it like I like I say every day, and mm-hmm. I deal with the public every day, and that's what I do. And it's like you like you say, just subtly at some times because yeah, you you know yourself, you you're not going to go at someone, you know, just like. And I realize this even with the religious people in my family. You're not going to go to someone that's very religious and mm. try to tell them there's no such thing as God because you see, right, <laughs> you're yeah. just going to just going. <laughs> Yeah. They're just going to tell you, you know, go away. But <laughs> exactly. but I, I like even when you talk about it, especially because when you talk, I like to actually use some of the po- political propaganda. I like using it against them. So when they talk about, like, especially with people that are on the left political spectrum, right, they talk about being environmentalist and this. So that's like, well, you guys, if that's the case, you guys and gals, you should be just like me every day around about the fact with these 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 the, whether it's the OPEC cartel or this constantly central plan with the oil prices and stuff. I mean, think about it. We live in a world today where there's literally there's three billion plus barrels stashed in many onshore facilities. Then you have all these uh, VLTs, the very large these vessels that are they're storing it because there's a massive overglut of this stuff. But to keep the prices inflated, they need all these central planners to come together, right? Mm. Because they don't want to allow natural market forces to dictate what the price could be. Right. And that's, to me, it's like, well, the, lefty, the lefties are always talking about environmentalism. Well, then don't talk about, you know, just corporations. Talk about the fact that Governments and central planners are what are incentivizing these companies to do this crap. That's the whole reason why they're because they would actually under a normal market forces, most companies would probably just like to be selling their product and competing with each other for market share. But because you have like the OPEC cartels, which to me that's funny, is like they're actually literally admitting when they talk about that is there's no such thing as natural market forces when they're talking about the price of oil because they all get together and so I mean it's completely central planning. But the the lefties don't seem to understand. Well, it's government and central planning that and central banks that allows this whole thing to happen. Mm. If you're so against it, if you want to protect the environment, well, humans, for the most part, even though yes, we like to enjoy all the benefits and the resources, in reality, if you get well with private rights, if everybody owns what they own, if you own your property, your vehicle and and everything, if everybody has a stake in the game and there is no central authority, then most people are going to want to take care, not just themselves, but their backyard. Naturally, you're not going to, you're not going to, and people aren't going to fall for these, these concepts of 
of just waste and, and, you know, like think of the billions or trillions of dollars that have been squandered that it could have been used for so many other things. Mm -hmm. But now they're just to keep these central planning narratives afloat and to keep all this monetary schemes and these Ponzi schemes going. When everyone knows mathematically, it's, it's almost an impossibility to keep it, but they want to, they want to keep younger generations believing in this stuff so they'll propagate it and keep the system going, which in reality, the best thing can happen just like with a family. You know, if I, if I put it this way, if I ran up my credit cards, I had them all maxed out, you know, my kids were, could barely eat because I, I'm just constantly spending all the money just to pay off the debts. Well, at some point in time, I'm going to have to recognize either I'm going to have to start selling something or I'm going to have to go through a restructuring or a bankruptcy because I can't keep imposing my Bad, bad decisions on my kids. Mm. But central planners, they don't seem to have that moral objection where you shouldn't impose not just your edicts, but plunder not just even the generations that are alive today. If, if you think about what we're doing, I don't, I know history fairly well, but I don't know if there's been any time in history where even kings had that capacity to use the power of mysticism to subjugate multiple generations. You know what I mean? Right, Be right. Because there was always, there was always, like you say, when you're talking about finite, finite resources, whether it was gold or silver, you know, a lot of people, when it was, when it was built under those standards, like you used a lot of trade and bartering and there was a finite amount of those, uh, you know, uh, commodities. But now when you live in the, the fiat world we live in, there's, there's no longer the restrictions. That's the problem that I see that's most paramount important other than other things I talk about is recognize the fact that this is all these debts, that all these politicians in current, there's no way that the people that are assuming and accumulating those debts, there's no way they can pay. So you're literally handing that stuff on your kids and grandkids. That there to me is... That's an easy part, and I found that when I'm talking to people out in the public, that's one of the easiest parts because most people, when you get into the statism thing, they go straight to the left or the right. Mm. But if you talk about the inherent immorality of forcing people that aren't even bored today or they're just small children to assume the responsibility to pay off the debts that you're incurring to enjoy whatever entitled lifestyle you're living today, I think even most people... Even those that don't really get into politics, I think most people at least understand the inherent immor immorality of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that would go a long way. It's going to take a lot. And, you know, it's not that I even think tomorrow or next week or next year. I don't even know if 10 years, 100 years, how long it's going to take. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, can we at least start slowing down and impeding the fact that we're trying to, you know, you have kids. You have two beautiful young children. I have two older boys. I, the last thing I want to do is see not anyone else's kids to be forced. I mean, look at what they're already being imposed with all of the things that they're having to do with, but to impose all of this extra responsibility to have to take care of not just you or I, but the most immoral people on the planet hmm. that to delegate that responsibility on these kids. Yeah, you, you'd, you'd go a long way to find people. I mean, well, I mean, you'd rec recognize in two seconds the person that tried to defend that. Most people won't even try to defend that. So that's a pretty good, it's a pretty good angle I found to go from, mm -hmm. like to start into the conversation because at least then they recognize it's a pretty easy way to recognize the inherent immorality to that. You know what I mean? Yeah, regarding um, environmentalism uh, as it relates to fiat currency, um, I like Stefan Molyneux's argument about um you know if if people were worried about the environment and you know the health of the of the biology you know the wildlife around them um fiat currency should be their the first thing on their priorities right because well that central banking and basically you know rigging of interest rates because what that does is um so so the rigging of interest rates you know basically you know what what are interest rates like the price of borrowing the price of money right so mm -hmm. it's how much you value something if you want to have it now as opposed to in the future when you can right. actually afford it right so if you want it now you got to pay interest <laughs> you got on, on that loan right and mm -hmm. and by suppressing those interest rates you are disrupting that market incentive natural market incentive to uh, yeah. conserve resources and you're encouraging um 
consumption that cannot be maintained, right? And that is destruction of finite resources right there. That's destruction of the environment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, you're encouraging debt, you're encouraging wastefulness and inefficiency, right? And so, and, and fiat currency is the same thing, right? If, if the politicians want to do something, they tax the people. And if they, they, if they don't want to raise too many taxes because they don't want to anger the people, they print money, right? Or, mm -hmm. sorry, sorry, they print currency. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I make that distinction no, very know, often yeah. with, my, with my kids. They know that, especially my son, my five-year-old. Um, you know, I say, what's currency? You know, and, and he knows it's paper. You know, yeah. it, it's just the paper that, that we use. And what's what's money? And he says coins, gold coins and silver coins. That's money. <laughs> so he knows <laughs> at five years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, but yeah, so so it's important to make that distinction because the fiat currency, um, it, you know, it, it again encourages wastefulness. Right. Because all they have to do if they want to buy something, you know, politicians print more money doesn't mm. matter if they have, you know, if they, if they have the stolen funds for it. They just print more money. And who eventually pays for that is everybody who has currency, who is saving in currency with, with the devaluation and depreciation of the, of the value of their currency. So, so you know, it encourages wastefulness and it encourages more theft, you know, basically what it is. And, and it's so funny that people... You know, not only do they do they not recognize that taxation is theft, they don't even rec they they they, don't, they go even further and they don't recognize that fiat currency is theft and is you know it's called the hidden tax of inflation, and uh, it's it's one of the most insidious and insidious and dangerous forms because it goes so unnoticed, right? I think Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, uh, said that you know it's it's so uh, subtle that not one man in a million will be able to detect what's happening right nobody really mm. can you know because it's so gradual and you don't feel it like you talk to your grandparents and they say yeah when i was young you know nickel we can go to the movies for a nickel <laughs> and, yeah and, and and people just think it's normal like you know yeah yeah the movies are like i don't know 14 dollars today and you just think that's ah, normal you know it's just life <laughs> but no it, that means yeah. <laughs> that means that the politicians have been slowly robbing everybody of value, right? And it's just as insidious yeah. and just as destructive as if a thief were to rob you in a dark alleyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, Actually, much worse because the thief, you would know the thief coming. That's the problem with politicians. Right, you would see the thief, thief coming, right? Right? <laughs> right? And you would recognize that inherent danger. That's right. the problem with politicians in the state is nobody recognizes the inherent immorality and the inherent danger because right. they've been taught to think that they're on the moral side of the spectrum. That to me, that's the that's the toughest part is trying to get people to understand that the people that talk like because that's the thing. They use populist speak, right? Just like you know, religious zealots. They use the they try to appeal to the masses, their compassionate side. Because that's the other thing too. Actually, I wanted to talk about this is because all the dogmatists, all the 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 central planners. The way they go about it, they must themselves believe that the majority of humans are naturally compassionate, moral human beings because the, the only way their system works is if most people fall in line and accept that they're supposed to yield their personal individualism for the greater good, right? Mm -hmm. So if, the most, if most people on the planet inherently believe that they're supposed to sacrifice their individualism for the greater good or society well that must tell you then obviously the majority of us be inherited because they go all along democracies are functioning all over the planet mm. so that to me should tell you right away that most people are probably well you know what i use when i don't understand things fully and when i don't have a scientific understanding or objective reason what i like to turn to is nature nature and the animal kingdom and just natural evolution or adaptation, whichever way you want to look at it. Because, you know, there's no such thing as a central planner in the animal kingdom, right? <laughs> there's no right. government. You know, and, and that all works. And you don't see animals. You'll, you'll never see a lion or a tiger. Now, if you kept, capture that lion as he's biting into the jug of the gazelle, that might look terrible. But that lion just wants to eat. Mm-hmm. Mm in that lion's mind, that lion just wants to eat. Right. It's it, you know it's filling its belly and it's just going through the life process. 
There's nothing inherently immoral. The, the lion, I, I can't see the lion sitting around with a couple others like, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to go mess this gazelle up real bad. Yeah, we're going to steal. From... No, you know, just like with humans. I don't think humans, when we're born, I think we're all born naturally compassionate, moral human. Well, we just, we're, we're basically actually beings that want to go, you know, meet an end, just like bacteria or animals, like, you know, we want to live out our life. Pro but there's nothing inherently in our mind, in our psyche that tells us that we should plunder or steal or oppress anyone else. Mm -hmm. That is a result of, of teachings, of, of propaganda, of dogma. If you negate that from the, the human psyche, there would be exceptions to the rule because there always is in, in nature and in humans. There's going to be exceptions to the rule. But the overwhelming majority of people on the planet are all going to accept the fact that you don't have any moral right or authority to steal or plunder, plunder from others. If you appeal and appease others or offer your you know, services, or pro they will reciprocate that in kind because we're, we are still inherently social beings, so we're always going to do what's not just right for ourselves, but for others because we recognize it's not just for ourselves, but for others, but because the reciprocal effect means we have to take care of ourselves and each other. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way it works because I am. I, I always say, hey, I have to come first. Mm -hmm. The only person that to put me first has to be me because right. I am me. Yep. <laughs> but I am. I also recognize the fact that I have to live and cohabitate and, and be kind and help others because that will be returned as, in a, as a dividend for me. You know, with, and that's how we, we have always come to cohabitate and coexist with each mm -hmm. other. It was the central plan planners, the dogmatists that decided, no, we're going to try to trick people's minds into thinking that they should use that compassion that's inherent in them and look at us as the authority that can make all that happen and they, they can just go about their merry life that that's the it's terrible that we've all fallen for this but i mean it's taken you know thousands of years for us to get to this point and it's probably going to take well i mean we're in the information age so i i expect that's going to be ramped up a lot quicker yeah because if you think about it whether it's the industrial age you know we might have went a hundred thousand years didn't didn't have much as far as like modern tools and stuff, but then just within what a couple hundred years, look at how much we advanced. We are now entering into the we're the precipice of the information age. Mm -hmm. I expect that 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 uh, it's just like the bell curve. It's going to ramp up even quicker, and we're going to have that capacity. But for it to happen, people like are required to do what we do. We have to spread this information. We have to help educate and inform others because that's the only way that happens. You have to propagate that. Mm -hmm. You know. People are only going to understand these fundamentals, these principles, when they've had, had them understood, where they can actually run through them in their mind. If they spend their whole lives under dogma, dogmatic beliefs that are hammered in the head through religious zealots or, or politicians, without us there to counteract, to be the counterweight against these guys, we're never going to advance humanity, which is why, you know, it, like... You and I know you put a whole lot of time and effort, and so do I. But to me, I do my for my peace of mind for the fact that I know it's right. But I also make sure that I do it because, unlike John Maynard Keynes with his concept of "well, we're all dead anyways," which is true. <laughs> right. But I also, but I also recognize that I have successive generations, and there are other people that are going to have to live in this earth. After yeah. I'm long gone. Right. To me, that's, I come first, but yeah, we might be all dead someday, but there's always going to be people that are going to, you know, replace us. And mm -hmm. to me, that's important. We got to think about not just now, mm -hmm. but the future too. Sure. Yes, exactly. Um, so I don't want to keep you any longer, but I do want to say uh, one um, study that I, I remember reading about before we close. Um, and it's, it's related to the idea you said that we're all born um, compassionate and moral, right? And so the idea is that, um, you know, two infants are, uh, you know, next to each other and um, and then in front of them, there's a box. Right. And so a person has a puppet. Right. And so the one puppet is trying to open the box. Right. The puppet's having a hard time opening the box. Then um, for the one infant, the pup, another puppet comes and slams the box shut. Right. So obviously hindering, not helping <laughs> the other puppet. Right. And right, then right. and then the other infant. Uh, same thing, P puppet's trying to open the box, and then another puppet comes and helps 
the other puppet open the box, right? Mm-hmm. And then what was interesting was afterwards, they offered both puppets to the infants, right? And it was like 80 to 85% of the infants chose to have the puppet that helped. <laughs> Mm, <laughs> that, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Really, yeah. it's really amazing how how the human mind works. Before yeah. any any speech, you know, any idea of morality, um, you know, so so it almost seems like you know we're born um, wanting to help each other, and you mm-hmm. know, and wanting there to be peace, right, and as opposed to conflict, right? Because it's, it's a win win, right? Because we know that we initially, when we do good deeds. We, we uh, are helping other people and the other person, if you do a good deed for that person, you know, you feel better to recognize the fact that because you've done that for them, you know that they probably have that same concept and that feeling towards you. Yeah. So there's that reciprocal effect, right? Right. And to me, whether you're in the animal kingdom, that's because, like I said, we're all social beings and we have to rely on each other for, as for some aspect in some ways. Mm. Yeah, of course, people, that's just in the animal kingdom, cats, dogs. I don't know if you've ever had animals, but mm. you can see that if you have have, had, have ever had animals, you can see that even in animals. They, yeah. It's the same same concept and their brains aren't nearly as well developed as a human being. So. It's a disappointing thing that a lot of animals got things figured out better than some <laughs> humans. Right? <laughs> right, it's true. But we're all going to get there someday. We're trying. We're doing our best. Uh, but yeah. awesome conversation, um, Bennett. So please, before we go, just um, plug your, you know, where, if, where people can find you if they want to follow your work. Oh, thanks, Neil. Yeah. Um, so uh, my most important one, obviously, is my YouTube channel. I've got, I think, like 130 videos now. Um, I cover basically every aspect of Canadian Libertarian. I will admit that I'm, I don't do a whole lot of editing with my videos, so it's a little raw, and I, I got to cut down. I, I, I've actually been pretty good in this video, <laughs> but yeah. I, I do swear. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I use some vulgarities from time to time. I'm going to try to cut that back in my videos, but Canadian Libertarian YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube, just type in Canadian Libertarian. It's the very first one, even before the Canadian Libertarian Party. <laughs> so so nice. it's number one on Excellent. the YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, Facebook, uh, Canadian Libertarian is another where I post a lot of my videos and, and content. And on Twitter, like you said, uh, I am already fr- free with each word, capital at the front, so capital I, capital A, capital A, capital F. I am already free. Um, I'll probably switch that over at some point in time to Canadian t- Libertarian to make everything more seamless. But yeah, yeah. All I, all I really want is for people to just help share and spread this stuff. That's all, you know, and, and give me some feedback. That's another thing, too, because I, as much as I think I understand quite a bit of fundamentals about liberty and all those things, I'm a human being. I'm always constantly learning. And I, I don't mind being challenged. I like people to any, to me, that's, actually, that's, how, that's how I think that we all grow and, and expand our knowledge is by being challenged. If someone didn't challenge my, my knowledge, I'd probably still be, uh, you know, ignorant to a lot of the facts that I understand today. So if we all want to help each other out, sure, everyone has different things because they were raised in different environments, but let's challenge each other. Let's challenge each other's beliefs and don't just use, you know, rhetoric that you heard from someone else. If someone puts a point forward, go by what the defined meanings in terms of what they're talking and discuss that topic. Don't go off on tangents on one way or the other. Let's actually deal because I've seen it happen on too many times where people, they just go off in their political narratives and nothing actually really gets covered is just arguing and bickering back and forth. If we're going to expand human intellect and, and the human mind so that we all understand freedom and liberty, we have to be universally consistent we have to get rid of all this political nonsense, and we got to help spread each other. And that's why I, I help to share your stuff. And everyone else that I, that I visit, lots of pages, I share constantly because I want people to hear me, hear everyone else too. I'm just one person. I'm just one lowly human being trying to help everyone else out, and I know you are too. Excellent. Excellent message. Thanks a lot. So, so one, another uh, last question I'd like to ask all my guests is, um, what's your favorite quote? Um, of of all time. <laughs> what? What, what? Oh no! Because well, I actually have one right behind me because I kind of kind of thought it up a little bit myself. Although I'm not sure, I'd ha- probably have to look and see if someone actually fully incorporated. Yeah. But um, with the Ron Paul thing, especially, and I get it with the revolution stuff. But you know what? That that word revolution, I think it's been used way too many times. And if you 
once again, <laughs> if you deal with what that word represents, revolution means coming back around. Mm. My whole thing nowadays is true liberty requires, requires evolution, not revolution. Mm. That means we have to evolve past all the dogmatic stuff that we were indoctrinated with. I don't want to necessarily revolve back around. Right. I, want to, I want to progress and advance humanity properly, intellectually. So, yeah, I guess we, I know it's kind of tight my own horn there a little bit. Sorry, I apologize for that. But it, no problem. <laughs> that's why I did. I, I, I think it's foundationally important is, yeah, humanity needs evolution, not revolution. Excellent. I love it. I love it. So, uh, so if anybody wants to, um, well, well, yeah, please, so please follow him and like his page and follow his uh, YouTube channel. And we know we need to help each other. And in doing so, we uh, will help to spread the message and, um, you know, bring more liberty and freedom to the human race. So that's our goal. So if anybody wants to help me out, uh, you can do so through Bitcoin um, or PayPal or Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism you want to help me out um donate you know just even a dollar a dollar a day or a dollar a, a month is is fine you know whatever you can uh if you find value in my content please um please uh, donate I, I appreciate you know we i support um the only democracy i support is um in capitalism right you vote with your <laughs> dollars right if you see value yeah. somewhere and you want to see it persist you 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 patronize it right you vote you you vote with your dollar that's that's true democracy the way i see it you know no coercion required right so always a win win situation and if you have any comments or questions about the show you can always email me at danilo kipu at yahoo.com danilo d a n i l o kipu k i p u at yahoo.com uh for any comments about the show so uh bennett thanks a lot for coming to the show really appreciate it uh wonderful conversation uh so this thanks. is but you know what all out of all the people um, I have I have great admiration and respect for you. I like how I like how you present yourself. You you're very articulate. You're you can tell you're you. you're a good per you, yeah. Like there's a lot of people that I follow, tons of them, tons and tons. But you're way up there on my list, man. I, I like how you do things. You come across great. You're very presentable. Um, I you're one of the first guys i'd love to share all my well i do that all the time i don't know if you yeah. know that but i share your stuff yeah, all the time it. because i think you come across your i can be a little harsh at times so i like sometimes <laughs> when you when there's a topic covered <laughs> uh -huh. when i think i probably haven't covered it quite i like to share yours because i think you you present it in a, in a little bit better way than i do at times but Thank thanks you. for everything you do man this is peaceful anarchism on the voluntary virtues network and the seeds of liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.